they said it's science fiction uh, thing, and they made, made it very clear that they expect it to be very popular, and we might be asked to open supermarkets. All right, let's welcome Jan Chapel. Watch the wire. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, let me Good. go. So strange, I didn't know who that woman with that short hair was and what she was saying with that piece of paper and I came out, oh, who's that? That's not me. No, that's not me. <laughs> it, was a, it was an entire tribute to your character and to Callie. Yes. But from the season one box set, I think, so it was primarily focused on the first season. So first, let's start by saying uh, that in 10 years of L.I. Who, this is the first time I've ever sat down and spent an hour interviewing somebody on stage. I usually delegate that, and I love doing this, but I usually have to delegate it. But in this case, I thought to myself, who could I get that knows a lot about Blake Seven? And I want to sit here and dig deep into Callie, and the best person qualified for such a thing would be me. Ah. And so welcome. And then I took a bit of personal privilege in booking uh, this year having a guest from Blake Seven because I'm a huge Blake Seven fan, and I think that a lot of Doctor Who fans see a, a bit of a crossover there. There's a, some crossover appeal from the look and the feel of the show, and the writing. Lovely, because we've always felt like the poor relation to Doctor Who. So it's very nice to have a, a Doctor Who hug to Blake Seven. That's how I see it. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, if, if you're the type of person that like those classic Tom Baker episodes of Doctor Who, they would find a similar aesthetic in Blake Seven, even though the storytelling is much different. Maybe because I passed him in the corridor when we were working on it. And, and shared a few quarries, too, I hear. Is that yeah, true? I, I'm sure we did, yes. Yeah, yeah. No doubt we did. <laughs> but he, Tom Baker just walked past and looked over the top of your head. He never communicated with us at all. Mm. So, uh, because this is my first time interviewing at a convention that I put together, I, I'll have to go over a little of the, the, what I do, is I generally chat a little bit, and then I'll turn and, and say, at any point, I like this to be very communal, so if there's stuff that you want to talk about, you know, raise your hand, draw some attention to me, I'll try to come around, and we'll, we'll make this very conversational. I can interrupt. Of course, yeah, this is your interview, I'm just the facilitator. <laughs> Take, let's, let's rewind the clock back, let's go back to uh, being cast in Blake 7, because at the time, it was, it was right around the time that Star Wars was about to burst on the scene. Doctor Who had been on for a while. And along comes Terry Nation, who's got the hot hand at everything, pitches a few extra things. After the success of the Daleks, he pitches a few things, like Survivors yes. and Blake Seven. And along comes Blake Seven. Tell me a little bit about those, those earliest times. Well, the first thing I knew about Blake Seven was um, being called for an interview with uh, producer David Maloney, who had apparently come to see a play that myself and um, David, uh, who played Gan, were in. And as a result of seeing us, spotting us on stage, we were called up to have an interview for this um, series. And um, uh, yeah, a couple of interviews and um, the second one, I found myself sitting next to Paul Darrow, who rubbed his hands and said, this would be rather good, wouldn't it? And um, I wasn't so sure, to be honest, but uh, that's because it was a series, a uh, popular series, and I'd had a career that was very serious, and uh, one-off classical plays. It was a time before Ian McKellen and um, Derek Jacoby. Jacoby had uh, taken part in soaps and all sorts of series that we know well. And there was a rather sort of snooty thing. And she thought, oh, no, well, I've got to do a play, a play next for the uh, television or, um, yeah, theatre work. But I was, by this time, I was a single mum. And um, I wanted to find ways of just keeping my, my foot in the door and working. So I thought, well, it 
would be brilliant if I had a series because then I could afford some help and I could come out and work and um, also maintain my career and my, my family. So uh, you've ha you had two interviews. The second one was with Paul Darrow. What do you know about the show, those early times? What do you, um, do they, tell you, they say, it's a science fiction thing. Yes, they said it's a science fiction uh, thing. And they made, made it very clear that they expect it to be very popular. And we might be asked to open supermarkets and <laughs> might be recognized. And how comfortable would we feel with all that? So, so you know, you just sort of thought, oh, this, well, yeah, that's okay. I think that's that's okay. I can deal with that. Yeah. Um, and really, that was really that was the most important question they put to us was how we would you feel about being in a, and what they hoped it, and obviously anticipated it to be a popular series. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Do you remember very much about the first time you're going in? What the, some of the first things that you're shooting or first scripts that you were reading? Do you remember? Sort of the chronology of, of, of where no, it went? I, I'm very bad with those answers. I don't oh. have a great memory. And at the time, with a young, very young <laughs> young son, the logistics are sort of nanny and then one disappearing and finding another one and just keeping everything together was, was, a, was a bit of a distraction. And I was never great at remembering detail. I mean, my schoolwork was... Um, I didn't do badly, but oh my goodness, I had to work at remembering things. So I'm not going to be able to tell you a lot because it was how many years ago? 48 years ago? We won't, we won't mention how long yeah. ago it was. Um, early on with Callie being an alien, was yes. there any talk about anything unusual? Oh no, there was Perhaps. only the Len that some people may know that they were going to ask me to wear black, black uh, contact lenses. Well. Those were the days of hard contact lenses, and I didn't like that idea. Just on a you know a physical level, I thought, well, I don't know that I want sort of contact lenses. And also, I thought, if you had a sort of completely black eyeball, that would actually deny some expression in the eyes, you know, because of course your eyes dilate and it looks when you're happy or cross or whatever and I thought that would be a bit of a pity so I managed to talk them out of that idea. Yeah I always thought one of the one of the things that I really enjoyed about Callie uh, as a character was that uh, she's an alien but in outward appearance right it's very human there's, there's yeah. still emotions there's still you're not wearing any kind of just you know they didn't give you a horn or, or a no. tail or something <laughs> they, they made her no. very human. Yes. But still an outsider. Yes. You know, still yes. someone who's done, oh, this is, I'm not from your planet, I'm yes. from a different planet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You Do you think that came across, that she was just a bit other? And to begin with, I think vocally, um, I emphasized it in some way. I mean, just listening to that early bit just now, I remember, you know, uh, articulating it uh, with sort of a certain amount of clarity as though I was sort of speaking a foreign language, I think I thought I was doing. I'm not quite clear, but I, I noticed that, cause, but I didn't continue doing that through the series. From the start, in your first story, you're this rifle-toting rebel yeah. terrorist off to do, so, someone who we thought, we thought could be a dangerous character. Yes, that, that got kind of written down as time passed. I, I mean, in retrospect, of course, you don't know at the time, you don't realize that you do have any power, really, but I only recognized, really, right at the end, too late, that, of course, one did have some influence, especially after doing two series, and I could have, me and Sally could have gone and sort of, you know, appealed a bit more and said, look, we're a bit fed up being left on the Liberator Callie. while the lads go down. And Excuse me, don't interrupt. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, I meet this lady in my costume first thing this morning. Now this is interrupting me. Where am I? You're, you're interrupting yourself, right? With the, with her, with her, <laughs> but there's, there's Callie in, in yeah. uh, her first story. Yes, I, li I like that. Uh, I mean, I like the outfit, I must say. I thought it was very <laughs> impractical, but you never know. You might disguise yourself on a... 
I don't know, in a red puddle of paint. Um, well, what was impressive right from the start is you you hold your own against the three men yes. in the scene. You know, Thanks they come the in there and they're and they're trying to you know yeah. they're trying to uh, physically intimidate yeah. you, and yes. you're just not having it, which yes. I think right off the bat sets the tone for this. Yes. This character is not going to put up with any but crap. But she lost you. that, didn't she? It didn't continue sometimes, like that. Sometimes, I, I, I looking back on it. As someone who's watched the series over and over again, I think that what happens is there's a growth to the character. I, I think what happens is when you're when you're when you're the terrorist, Callie, it's fight or flight mode. You know what I mean? You're very yeah. much ready. I'm, yes, I'm, yeah. I, I'm ready for death because you've pretty much, and at the start, you've mm -hmm. pretty much resigned to the fact that this is it. I'm mm -hmm. I'm going to make one last fight of it. Then you have a rebirth with the character, yeah. and the safety of the Liberator allows Callie to go back into this thinking, you know, not fight or flight anymore, but the, yeah. the character is allowed to comfortably ma yes. mature over the three seasons. That's, I know, that's a really long explanation. With that family of um, chaps and uh, girl on the Liberator, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, you, as the in the first season, it's very difficult, you know, because you, you're trying to find, the show is trying to find its footing. Everyone yes. is, every actor, every writer, every director, to, to see where it's going. Yes. So part of that journey in the first season, do you remember uh, watching those ebbs and flows? And Yeah, well, it, 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 you make it sound very sort of subtle and things, but actually, of course, it was, oh, here's a new script, where are the scenes? What, what happens to be here? Oh, oh, a telepathy, oh, right. So I must say, it was quite, difficult to have an overview in a sense because you were just going oh here's a new script let's learn it let's get on with it and do our best so often blake seven is credited for shows that have come after it things like farscape and uh babylon five and even star trek the next generation which you know uses a very similar uh, season-ending cliffhanger, as Blake Seven does. It was influential on other shows because it, it was ahead of its time in putting these sort of story arcs where any character could be in danger at any time. You know, on most of the television, the character was only in danger if it was the end of their contract, you know, the end of the season. You're waiting for it. <laughs> yeah, but, but not on Blake Seven. You didn't know who was going to come, who was going to yeah. go. But... Because it was the first, it was, I guess, difficult to actually consciously think about, we're going to do a story arc. I think it's just yes. sort of finding its way, and, yes. and the arc comes later, doesn't it? I think that's, that's probably very true. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm overanalyzing this stuff, but it's only because I watched it 4,000 times. Okay, now that I've got the conversation rolling, if anybody wants to participate, of course, just you know, flag me down a little bit, and we'll jump in on this conversation as, as we go on. Yeah, second season, second season now as we're going along, um, one of the big things, Somebody of course. Somebody wants to say something. They do. They've Did I miss that? They've people put their hands up as you look down. Yes. And then later on, you eventually finally have, well, I guess by the time Sue comes in for Callie's done. We had two seasons with Sally. But, uh, okay. And then it was third, third season, Josette. Wait, keep my question for later. Okay. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> yes, this man over here. This is just more of a comment. Um, I, I was watching your first episode, your first appearance, and I noticed like the interaction between Bill, you, Villa, and, and Blake, and then Avon comes in, and there's the exchange between I notice the look he gives you and the look you give him, it's like, I can get on with this person, you know? And it was like, there, there seemed like there was, I, I don't know, with the other two it was just like conversation, but with Avon there was like a look and like chemistry. Oh. And I'm just wondering, you know, was, well, I don't know if that was deliberate. Or I don't know either. It was probably <laughs> just intuitive um, reaction and action. I don't know. Well, I'm just looking at, look at it. Oh, right. Oh, that's, that's, what I that, that's nice. Well, I did meet Paul. Maybe we sort of had a moment of bonding when I met him outside the door before we were cast, and he rubbed his hands. I said and said, this would be jolly good, wouldn't it? <laughs> One of the things, uh, I, I, to, to Edwin's point, the relationship 
uh, between your character and, and uh, Paul Darrow's character is uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, a unspoken respect. I think that's, that's a great word. Like he, he sees that Callie's a strong woman. She's not going to take any crap from him, even if he tries to bully his way through he it. He can't telepath like me. I mean, I do have a, a skill. Yeah, you a bit have like, a skill. Yeah, but he can't, he can't sort of make fun of me like he does of um, Villa, who has right. a skill that he doesn't have. He uses him like that. Yeah. But he can't really use um, Callie's... Callie seems to be a bit of a truth teller. Skill of telepathy. <laughs> yeah, probably unnerves him a like, little bit. At, at, at some point... Characters like Blake and, and Avon, who both are, are running their own agenda, and along comes Callie, who, like a bit of a you know a, a, a bit of a wet blanket, says, "Well, you know, if we do this, it's gonna it's gonna go horribly wrong," <laughs> and they don't listen to you, and it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> and if they just would have listened to Callie, everything would have been fine. Wouldn't it? <laughs> it wouldn't be much of a series, would it? <laughs> but in the second season, you get a few a few changes. Um, Stephen steps out as Travis. Brian comes in as Travis. So there's a little bit of a cast change. One of the one of the few times with Blake Seven where it's like a, you know, it's a hard change there. Yeah, Something it was that's a hard t- change because it was it seemed such a strange thing to do so early on. You know, having had the, just the one series, it was kind of kind of disappointing. Well, I was disappointed because of knowing Stephen so well, because remembering him at drama school at the same time, you know, and suddenly, oh, he's gone. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> for good reason. A, yeah, a, f- a few changes in there, as well as June Hudson, as we talked about yes. a little bit about the costumes, yes. which June is fantastic. Was it, was it Barbara Kidd the first time, or was she the third season? Does anyone know? No, I no. don't. No. Because June, really. I found a little bit over the top at times, because I didn't like... It was when the uh, crew at one point said that I looked like olive oil because I was wearing these um, flat hush puppies and the green and the white sort of cloak. And they called me olive oil. I didn't like that. <laughs> Here comes olive oil. I was really upset that time, because I didn't really want them to mess about my hair and cut it either. That, that wasn't my choice. So I was a bit unhappy that season. <laughs> She had a tendency to make things very ornate and very mm. fancy, and but by leaning that way, it's less practical yeah. visually. Yeah. Everyone knows that you look less like a, the crew of a yes. of a mighty warship, and you know yes, a little yes. more like the love boat. Well, in I fact, and originally the shoes were going to be something else, and I just said, "Look, this is somebody who's got to run. I just need. Can you just give me some flat shoes?" So I probably contributed to the olive oil. Um, Thing. <laughs> uh, it, the show was on the air. It's in the first year. It's in the second year. Are you, are you feeling the success? Like the, you know, that people are watching it. It's exciting. It, it's living up to expectations. Well, was there you any know, talk it, like that? It's funny because you are so involved and engrossed doing it. You you you're just you're doing the job. And I mean, you slowly noticed, as I say, by I suppose the the, the end of the second series, like Kids in the Street. You know, I'd walk up the street and suddenly they're going, ah, <laughs> Kelly, you know, um, that, that started to happen. And, um, but I mean, we weren't reading reviews or anything. We were just, it was, it was, it was high, quite hard work, really. Um, well, it certainly was as a, a, a newish parent with a, under a year old he was when I started, 10 wow. months old. And uh, so I, it, that was a big distraction. I don't know, maybe... Some of the other crew might have a different perspective, but I was, I was sort of, I was quite pushed, generally. It's, it's just a quick comment. Um, growing up in England in the late 70s, and Blake 7 was required viewing Monday night 7.20, and then the next, something you said about school, the next day at school in the playground, it was like, did you see what happened in Blake 7 last night? And yeah. Callie was in those conversations a lot. It yes. like, yeah, it was required viewing. Yes. And of course, in those days, I mean, you'd never say that, but we were told by the production that the, the, the target audience was, was children <laughs> and dads after work. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, couldn't say that now. You wouldn't dream of saying that now. It's a but family that's show. What, they exactly shoot what they people said. in the back, but it's a family show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't let my, when the third series, the fourth series, I, I didn't let my son watch it and 
uh, well, I mean, it was quite violent anyway, wasn't it? I mean, for, if, when, when he was five, four, five, six, yeah. I still think it was a little bit hard, so harsh, but... I think that um, it fell somewhere between Doctor Who, which is, you know, straight up family viewing, viewing. Um, and then, you know, in modern Doctor Who, they, they, they did spin-offs like Torchwood, where they, because they could do adult themes. Blake Seven's somewhere in the middle. It's not exactly Torchwood, like there's no cursing or, you know, explicit sex or anything. But there was definitely a, a move to be away from family mm. in the subject matters and, and the way characters were interacting. They're, they're sometimes they're not particularly nice to each other. Mm. There's a very adult situations and, and most importantly, the violence part of it where, you know, um, <coughs> characters were uh, at the risk of death, you know, at any moment. Mm. Mm. And the audience knew that because because they killed Gan yeah, they killed <laughs> guns on each other. Uh, absolutely. So, what, you know, did, you say, what did you say? I said they're constantly pulling guns on each other. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a very unhealthy relationship. <laughs> right. so, I mean, yeah, I can't imagine it could be a target audience, but it's kind of an unhealthy relationship between two people. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. In that, right? Yes. No, because that is what they, they said it. Children, I, uh, and I imagine they were talking about sort of uh, not five and six year olds, but I, I obviously sort of 10, 11, yeah, 12 yeah. sort of thing. Middle yeah. schoolers somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, who were looking for, you know, a little, a little bit different adventure. And, and at the time, too, thinking about some of the other things that were coming out, you know, on television, Space 1999 was on, you know, not too long before that. No, it was never part of the conversation. It was never part of a dynamic that was ever discussed. Um, and it wasn't in my head either. Um, you know, uh, we were just <laughs> getting on with work, as it were. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it must have been something there, for, because of course it's not the first time one's heard that quite often. Well, I yeah. that, I think. I the first time watching that, going, please don't go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every episode, and then it, then it kind of backed up on the big you know, I, I tell a story quite often about you know coming to Doctor Who as an American, as a 13-year-old kid. Uh, it was refreshing to watch a show where it wasn't all about kissing, because that was everything on American television. Even if it was an 8 o'clock show and it was Knight Rider or something, the lead character and the guest star of the week always had a kiss or something. So it was refreshing to see that. And you know, it's funny, I never thought of Blake Seven being in the same mold, but thinking about that now, one of the things that I was as a kid probably attracted to was the fact that again a group of people were together for mutual benefit but it didn't turn into a, the sex show you know no, it wasn't, we, wasn't the love boat we had the, how many kisses were there in I mean there was the Jacqueline and Paul and then was sarcophagus but how many other kisses were they count the kisses in yeah, we have to do a, <laughs> Josette and Paul yeah right which so we there weren't many over I mean yeah, yeah. Did you see him kissing Lorna? When? Oh, Villa, that's right. Yeah. Poor Villa. Poor Villa. <laughs> Aw. All right, so now we're in the third season. Things have changed a little bit. Things have started to change. The lead actor has decided to step away. Uh, and only in a crazy, wacky science fiction world would you have a show called Blake Seven and there's no Blake in it. And there isn't even a seven. They can't even count. 
the lead actor's gone and the counting is, and the math is wrong. Yeah. What the hell's going on? Oh my gosh. Yeah, but uh, it's a change of direction, introduce some new faces, um, but a few faces are gone. What's it like losing two friends, you know, two friends who decided to step away? Yeah, it was disappointing, really. Um, uh, but, but I mean, <laughs> You know, you didn't concentrate on it. We had to move on. There was a space of five months after we finished the end of that second series, and they were moving on, and we knew at least, you know, the thing was going to continue, and we were, those of us that came back were contracted and delighted to be so contracted again, because I suppose anything could have wound up, I guess. And um, then we delighted in welcoming Stephen and um, Stephen, because he was so young, really, but of course he had a very mature voice, which was so nice uh, to replace G Gareth and um, and Josette. So yeah, they were they they fitted in quite quickly. I mean, it was it felt quite comfortable, and we moved forward. Uh, do you remember anything about that transition period? As far as did you have to sit in on any? Um any read-throughs, any, uh, any auditions by no, Stephen no, no, or Josette? No. I know Paul did at one point. Oh, did he? Uh, well, no, it, it just moved very forward very smoothly, as I remember. Yeah. I, there was no, nothing special sort of allowances. And um, I'm sure that, yeah, David and Tourette's would probably have liked to have had Paul's input in terms of um, certainly uh, with, P, um, with Stephen, for Stephen uh, taking over from Gareth, yeah, it was very important. Uh, was course. there any hopes on your part or on with Michael and definitely with Paul? We know he had ambition to, you know, when, when Gareth left, to, his character was going to be like, look at me now, you know. Yes. But for you and Michael, was there a thought that, oh, um, we're gonna, we'll have a, a little more spotlight on us as well or anything like that? No, I don't think anything. like that. Not at all. No, we were just a team. I just yeah, saw it just as a team and a cast and somebody being replaced. Really? Um, one didn't sort of think like that. <laughs> because it, it did happen in some ways. Like you said, there's a few stories where we get to see yeah. a little focus on, on different characters. Yes, but see, that, that, see that was throughout the series. You thought, oh, this is so yeah. more so and Zern's one and this is somebody else's, you know. Now, as a child of Auron in Children of Auron, oh, I loved you that one. got to play I two just parts. I loved that, and because I was getting so bored with one part, you know, because you used to... That, the point is, that's why you go in the business, because you want to keep playing different characters, and suddenly you're doing the same one, and quite often similar things are happening, you know. Oh, she's gone into a trance again. <laughs> oh, dear, here we go again. Um, and uh, so, of course, when I saw that it was the opportunity to play two characters it was really exciting and so you think how different can I make them now how opposite what can I do this is fun so yeah it was lovely doing you know sarcophagus and children and, and just the whole technical thing of children of iron was kind of fun and funny to me you know trying to make you uh, both uh, <laughs> interact with each other yeah, at the talking, same time talking to myself yes yeah. yes no, uh, and, and and trying to carve out making um Callie's sister a little bit different. Uh, where do you go? Is it down to voice? Uh, how do you make? How do you make her a sibling oh, he's without? Oh, now he's gone. He's going. Uh, oh, don't go. Uh, he's like I had enough. Don't go. Uh, I'll, I'll come back for the red dwarf panel. Come back. Oh, oh good. <laughs> we'll catch you up. We go. Um, I, it, it's something that happens on the inside. You know, it doesn't. It, it doesn't start with the. For me, it doesn't usually start with a physical thing. I was thinking, how different could I make her? And I immediately thought, let's make her a little bit slow, a bit thick or something. <laughs> a bit dopey. Um, that was my thinking. So I just sort of went inside and felt something different. Um, not so confident, not quite so sure of myself, something like that, which then sort of starts to affect you. If you think like that, you know, you physically, you change, something else happens. So it, it, it is for me, it is some internal um, organic thing that happens when, when you're trying to find or think out a character, something different. I mean, or, or, I, I mean, acting is really, when somebody's miscast, it's because there's a bit of themselves that they can't find that doesn't exist. But otherwise, of course it's you playing you, and you can only play what's possible for you. And it's like feeling a, 
an element that you possess, whether it's a kind of something kind of spiteful and hurt and unhappy, then you you know you go around with that deep down inside, which starts to affect you physically, and then a character kind of emerges. They can be happy above it, but inside, inside they're hurt or whatever it is, or you know you give them yourself a backstory, and then a character you slowly find a, pa a character, but usually from inside out. That said, you can work the other way. You can walk around feeling as though your heart's in your feet and your whole sort of center of your attention is in your feet. And if you walk around feeling like that a lot, you will actually start to feel quite depressed and you feel the energy dropping down. And that's another way you can do it in a physical way. Kind of somebody who walks around and then different rhythms, fast or slow, heavy or light. And you think about walking around. If you sat now and you were thinking just of your knees the bottom part of your body, that's all, that's your centre of attention, is that your energy will sort of feel droop down, yeah? Same time you could send it up to your head and you can become all sprightly. So are they all different kinds of ways, but they're the two outside in or inside out that you can explore. That's the way I work anyway. I mean, I work different ways, but generally from the inside out. You made it back. back. You didn't miss yeah. anything. Welcome back. Welcome back. We don't have to catch you up on anything. Okay. So uh, that episode, actually, Children of Aron, also featured another Li Who guest this weekend. That would be Michael Troughton, who you got to see, but yes, unfortunately didn't get a never. I didn't know, and in fact, only because of this event, because the name didn't mean anything. And I know um, David Troughton, and in fact, when my son was born, David and my son's dad, Tim Woodward, were both cast and appearing in a, a, a drama series called Wings about First World War pilots. And um, Sam Troughton was born around about exactly the same time as my Sam. And um, Tim and I and went up to visit, were invited to visit David and Ali with their little boys, <laughs> Sam Troughton. So I was thinking of that. So I was thinking, my, who's Michael Troughton? Is he had another son I didn't know they had, a Sam and a Sarah Michael? And that's when I did my homework to check. I knew all about the guests here this weekend. And I realized that um, Michael was a, an uncle of uh, Sam Troughton. Yeah, yeah. and, and Pilot 4-0 in Children of Auron. So yes, in, whom I never met. It was Diane Gies of Horizon who yeah. uh, gave me a small a part, and part where I think he has some kind of yellow mustardy thing come out of him when he's, <laughs> when he's <laughs> dying, was, a, I dying a horrible death. I again, yes. I yes. took out for it again. Yes. Small but powerful part. Yes. So, uh, as we're moving along, we have a little bit of time left, and I'm reminding anybody who wants to jump in on the conversation, they're more than welcome to do so. Go ahead, Stu. Yeah, I mean, to me, one of the hallmarks of Lake City, of course, the costumes. Oh, good. Like, it was so elaborate, and the makeup was so elaborate, and the costumes were so elaborate, you had to really work hard to get that right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
gown with the big sort of shoulders. I wasn't happy really in that one. The yeah. green tights. No. So you didn't get to sneak any of the costumes off the set and keep them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I did for a while have the green leather trousers, but they'd split by then and were unwearable. <laughs> Well, you were reunited last summer at a Blake 7 convention over in the UK with some of the costumes. They, there's a, a yeah. hell of a, a collection. One single collector has put together, what, about 50 costumes yes. from the show. So I saw a few of yours in there as yeah. well as... Well, Sally managed to keep a dress, which she then sold, I think, to that guy for quite a lot of money. She is proud to tell me. <laughs> She's proud to tell you. <laughs> And you're thinking, if I only took, if I only grabbed <laughs> I, something I, out of it. I'd keep the old necklace. I think, oh, this is quite nice. I have one to that one. Did you get? Did you have people asking you to to, to nick something off the set once it became popular? The bracelets. No, but the bracelets. The bracelets generally disappeared. It, it wasn't the cast that were taking them, but they, they seemed to be every week. There seemed to be, oh my God, we need to, you know, short of teleport bracelets again. But I did. I did. I was telling somebody today. I got a letter from, there's a prison for extremely um, dangerous prisoners in a prison called Broadmoor. And I had a letter, a fan letter from Broadmoor. And um, we learnt that the teleport bracelets were made of drain pipe, which as I grew up, apparently was a very favorite burglar route up into houses was to climb up a drain. Drain pipe. So I thought it'd be a real hoot to get hold, and I asked the guys in props, please, could I have a teleport bracelet to sell, send to a fan in Broadmoor and tell him it was part of a <laughs> drain pipe that might interest him and he might be able to use? <laughs> Go ahead, right down here. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you're right. I, I, I mean, I, I, I believe that. I mean, it's not like I sat down and analysed it, but you're absolutely right. You know, I had more respect. I was very suspicious of and didn't trust Avon. Not with anything really ever not really ultimately but you know one one trusted blake that was the different there was trust there and um so i'm sure that that you read that yeah absolutely right well how how much of that is established right off the bat i mean he's the first person you meet in the show um and of course there's a little trickery going on there where he he, he tricks you he fakes you out to test your telepathic abilities and and gets the upper hand. So, how, how much of that trust starts at that moment? Is there? Oh, I do you know honestly. I'd have oh, to watch it again, you know, to remember that kind of detail. Wow. I don't know. I mean, my my I, opinion. I need to stop it, watching it over and over again. As I'll I have to say. watch it several times, I think, again. Yeah, I, I know, because I, I don't remember. I just this. know that I I trusted I trusted I trust Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, yes, that was there, definitely. Mm. Good. I was wondering how you thought about how they decided to get rid of your character after you decided not to return to season four. Oh, it was my fault. Because <laughs> they kept up. They, first of all, they offered me the series again. And I knew that I got to a point where I was getting very restless. And, I mean, as I say, you thrive off being challenged by different characters as an actor. I certainly do, you know, wanting to do that. And I so wanted, I started to want to change, you know, I'd watch the other, because we'd all rehearse. We did, we did a lot of video tape recording in those days. So we would go to the BBC and we'd see all the other programmes all going up to do different things, you know, this, that and the other. And I get quite jealous. I think, oh gosh, I wish I was doing that now, you know. Oh. And we felt also that the BBC didn't, they were, they were snobby really, they didn't make us feel like they relished the fact that it was such a popular series, you know, they were a bit snooty lot. And we used to think that if we were working for ITV anyway, we would have got more money. <laughs> 
would have got more money. And also, we might have been treasured a bit more. So one was aware of that. You know, they were just... So they didn't... It didn't give you a great feeling, if you see what I mean, that I think we probably, in retrospect, I think we deserve seeing as they've gone on selling and, you know. Mm -mm -mm. Um, so, I've, do you know, I've, I'm so sorry, I am quite senior now. I forgot what the question was. How did you go back to helping, how did they got rid of your power? Oh, yes. So they offered me an, a, another series, and I said, oh, no, I, I really feel I've got to move on and, you know, fresh pastures. and Because I don't believe you can do your best work unless you feel you're really behind it. You can't, it wouldn't be a shame, you know. And you, we, we're all trying to do and we're doing our best work as far as we could. And um, so then they said six or something. Then they said three, and I didn't know. He said one, I didn't know. And he ended up, it was me. And then if I'd known, because I'd learned later, of course, how upset people were, that <laughs> Sally was just a, I mean, that Callie was just a, a voice at the end. I think if I'd known how seriously it would have been taken, I would have made a different decision. I would at least have done two or three episodes just to make every sure everyone's going to be happy 30 years later. <laughs> Yet there's uh, the end of the third season in Terminal. You, the show pretty much wraps up at that point. Like, that was the end. And then a voiceover comes after it's broadcast saying that Blake Seven will return next year, which was a surprise to everyone, wasn't it? Yes. And, and suddenly you're all like, oh. We um. did quick rewrites, because they, they'd written the whole series for Callie at that point. So they did the kind of rewrite with Sue Lin and adapted it a bit, and yeah. I mean, so yeah, gave them a bit of a quick, headache. Yeah, quick, quick uh, a change of direction, very last minute, and almost reinvented the entire show, although at that point you had stepped away, but they, they, it's almost like they had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm when you get to that fourth season. But you must know some of the things that have gone on in the fourth season, right? Someone, anybody tell you about that? What happened in the fourth season? I haven't seen the fourth season. At all? I haven't watched it. Oh. Uh, uh, I, what, I tell you, I did only relatively recently because I heard what a terrible shock the end was. I did watch the last episode. And what was your reaction to it? Yeah, it was quite horrifying, really, wasn't it? It was a shock. It was the, the Christmas massacre, is that what they called it, Edwin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it went out just, just before Christmas. I know, it's terrible. I thought it was going to run for like a few more series, and then that happened, I'm like, well, I guess Blake's not coming back. And then I actually listened to the guns to see who fired last, and of course, when video came out, that was the first thing I did, rewound it. Oh. It might come back. <laughs> oh no! I mean, that's terrible. I think it's terribly irresponsible. I think we should have had people, kind of somehow, mental health <laughs> <laughs> professionals coming and saying, "Look, actors, it's all very well. You earn this money. Now you can't just go away and let people die." <laughs> like this. Playground. The next day, we actually learned to swear after that episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of those things that, that really defines the show in some ways because uh, there's, a, there's, an, there's an, a, a number of unique aspects about Blake Seven over the course of four years, but what really defines it quite often is its ending because it, it is a huge, huge risk yeah. just to say, yeah, tr course, try bringing the show back now. It shouldn't have happened because it was Terry Nation's branded thing so they destroyed his what he'd put work into and apparently you're not they're not really supposed to do that not without his not without his uh, consent sort yeah. of just right we're writing your series off like that no. yeah and just kind of killing it off so yeah go ahead right Callie well in addition to leaving a bunch of us uh, yeah, pre-teen and teenagers and uh, you know Have you found that like there's a lot of like young women who identify 
I, no, never. But I identify with that myself. And um, I only really sort of found my family, as it were, when I joined the National Youth Theatre. You know, because it was like, there were times when I was obviously sort of over energetic or something, and, and the tension was drawn to that or something about me. Like, you think, oh, what? And I didn't, I, and I didn't like that, you know. Um, not that people bullied me or anything, but you felt like somehow something not quite. And so, but when I met the other people who loved theatre and the other creatives, I, I did. I finally felt I was normal, and we were all a bunch again. So I identify with what you're saying, but I didn't think of Cali like that. But it is true. It is true. And as I said to somebody here, I I, I am telepath. I mean, I am considered myself telepathic. It's like I'm always surprised when people say they don't believe in telepathy because I go, I think, how can you not? Because it's it's. I mean, not in any kind of deep way, but I always know who's on the phone. You know, I always know, and I also know when to ring people. Who got, you know, and there's a reason why I've had to ring them. You knew what time to go to the elevator this morning. <laughs> yes, I did, didn't I? Because we met this morning. I was leaving the room, and I'd heard all about Mab's costume from people in London that know Mab. And they said, look out for her. And she's got this wonderful costume that she's made herself. And I go out the room, and I just look up the corridor, and we're both walking towards the lift together. And Mab's come out in her costume for the first time. And we go into the lift, and my dear helper, Jane, is waiting at the bottom for us. And first of all, she sees Mab come out and goes like that. And then me, me behind her, thinking, what? what? It was quite pick funny. Your, pick your Callie. Yeah, it's so strange. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we have about five minutes to go, so I definitely want to make sure that we get any questions in. Okay, one back there. Go ahead. Yeah, you. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, of course, I have to ask, um, Finish uh, has you guys doing a lot more because they lost Paul and unless Jacqueline, they lost the time, unfortunately. So many other Well, Sally was thrilled that suddenly she, she sort of texted, because I'm, I'm a close friend with, with Sally, like I was a close friend with Stephen and Jacqueline, kind of, we maintained um, friendships, and which was reinforced by events like cons, and, and especially with the audios over nearly nine years or something now. Um, so, um, oh God, I've gone again. I haven't seen you a moment again. Um, what, what were you asking? Enjoying these the big finish. Oh no! N n oh, I see. No, no, we've got, no. Of course we're not. We, uh, those doing those full, um, full cast ones was brilliant. But yes, yeah, Sally texted me saying, "Oh, isn't it brilliant? The girls have now got you know. We now got we're so busy now because <laughs> we've done two very you know full on ones together. Yeah, that was fun." Yeah, one of the things I, I love about Big Finish in general is just the ability to explore, you know, to, to take a character that you only had in one story and kind of flesh it out and, and go on. I mean, they're legendary for that in Doctor Who, and they certainly were in, in Blake 7. What was it like? Oh, I mean, I just remember something else I want to tell you, really funny. Yeah, you know, just I, remind me that. I was going to ask you, you know, uh, what's it like revisiting a character after so long? You, go, you know, Big Finish invites you, you get a call. Jeez, we're getting the old band back oh, together. No. Oh, no, of course, it's a while back since I remember our first day back doing, when we went started doing the audios. But I remember just being impressed by how in this tiny little audio um, studios that we work in, how everything felt so similar to how it used to, albeit we weren't in a big um, rehearsal room or a studio with cameras. We were all sort of in front of mics in little places in front of our scripts. But the dynamic felt the same. It, it, and of course, the dynamic was similar. And people hadn't changed that much. And everybody was still true to, as it, even though there'd been a gap of quite a number of years, it was all recognizable and very comfortable. 
No, I was just going to tell you a funny story. I had a nanny when my son was three who came and worked with me. She was about 28, and um, she came from Wakefield. And uh, she was a brilliant nanny, loved her to bits, and she was anxious to get married and go back to, you know, go back north or whatever and get married. Anyway, she did get married to her first boyfriend in the end. And then <laughs> several years later, a friend of mine was working in the theatre, and she was working with a wonderful young actress who said to her, oh, do you know Jan Chapel? And my friend Sandra, who's a very close friend, said yes. And she said, oh, she said, oh, my mother was her nanny. And who was that but Jody? Oh, wow. Isn't that weird? Jodie Whittaker. Now, mum was Yvonne Whittaker. Wow. Isn't that strange? It's a certainly. So we did all meet. We didn't all keep, continue to keep in touch, but we did all meet up very early on after I discovered that story. My son came along as well, and Jodie was about. She'd, she'd left um, Guildhall a couple of years after. It was a couple of years after she left Guildhall. Edwin has another question. Edwin, aren't you hosting tomorrow? I am, but this is a quick comment. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's Edwin. Oh, Edwin. I'm, I'm hosting tomorrow. He's practicing for tomorrow. I'm seeing what he asks you today, so that's I right. will repeat it tomorrow. So. Mm. He'll ask all the good questions. I'm here in silence. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, um, I'm having a senior moment now. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, could you, as you're such good friends with Sally, could you tell her what a great time you're having here? <laughs> she would just she's jealous as hell she doesn't know why she's not here uh, 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 yeah. oh michael he's not so well sadly he i don't think he won't be doing audios again and he won't be coming he's got the dementia bit so he's been out of the loop for a while now, yeah. so it's he, very, he, very sad. Yeah, we, uh, very sad. We very tried sad to invite him last summer, and he had cancelled on yeah. the event that yeah. I met you at. Because he, he, he was going to come, there was talk that he might come to the convention that we do in the Cotswolds. Um, we were going, doing the Cotswolds last summer. They said he may or may not, but he never made that one. Yeah. So, no. I'm yeah, so he, sorry to tell he you He stepped that. away from a few scheduled appearances, and yeah. so, yeah. It, and, of course, Michael, I remember, in short trousers. Because he and I went to a, what they called, it was at the Guildhall School. It was a class for would-be young actors from the ages of 12 to 18. And there weren't many boys in the class um, that we had on a Saturday morning. And then we'd do a production sort of 12 weeks down the line. And we'd go along Saturday morning to rehearse. And Michael Keating was one of the boys uh, when we were about 14. So I, wow. I knew, knew Michael from the age of 14. Remember him, literally short, great trousers. He must have been about 12. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Edwin, what time is your panel tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. Jen is back up here tomorrow at noon with Edwin doing the questions. Jan Chapel, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, this is Bonnie Gordon, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Make sure to like and subscribe before the self destructs in five, four, three, two, one. Just kidding. Have fun and follow your fandom.